all. Well, uh, welcome everybody to uh, today's session on United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. I'm very happy, you know, to, to be here at Horasis and to welcome uh, today's panelists. Uh, first of all, Shireen Gavinder from South Africa. She is the CEO of SDG, STP Holdings, a uh, very successful businesswoman in the region, but also active in the field of uh, sustainability and uh, uh, women's rights. We also welcome uh, our friend, um, uh, Ma uh, Dr. Markus Till from Bosch. Uh, Dr. Markus Till is heading up uh, the Bosch organization in uh, Africa, and uh, we are eager to hear his insights and um, his uh, the industrial development on the African continent. I'm also very pleased to welcome Professor uh, Dr. Bertram Lohmüller from the Steinweiss Institute uh, in Tübingen, which is part of the Steinweiss University, Germany's largest private university. And he is a well-known uh, um, uh, expert on sustainability and green technologies in the European space. And uh, I would like to start today's session uh, with a greeting from uh, Gerd Müller, the Director General uh, from UNIDO. And uh, please uh, um, uh, enjoy now the, uh, his greetings uh, from Vienna. Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in dramatic times. A war is happening on Europe's doorstep. Millions of refugees have left Ukraine in recent months. Energy prices are soaring with terrible consequences for econ economies and families both here and around the world. UN Secretary General Guterres speaks of a hurricane of hunger and a collapse of the global food system. At the same time, we still face the devastating consequences of COVID-19. I call it a polypandemic with global implications for health, social development, education, and jobs. And these effects will unfortunately last for a long, long time. Moreover, the threat of climate change grows and grows. The latest report of the IPCC warns of an imminent climate catastrophe within our lifetime. The negative consequences of global warming are even worse than we feared. The poorest of the poor are the hit the hardest. We risk reversing the great progress we have made so far to reduce poverty and hunger and to put our planet on a more sustainable path. Ladies and gentlemen, despite all this, I am convinced that we can over available in the world. What is missing is a determined political will to channel the knowledge and funds into transformative projects and resilient infrastructure. To achieve this, we need greater global solidarity and multilateral cooperation. Africa has to be our main partner in this. Africa has the natural and energy resources to become the green continent of renewable energies. It can be the first continent to generate all its own energy from renewables. Cooperation, especially with European partners, the needed technologies, know-how, and investments can make this happen and provide an alternative to fossil fuels and nuclear energy in Europe as well. Ladies and gentlemen, this is also 
how UNIDO works. I was elected as UNIDO's new Director General in December 2021. The first European to lead the UN's Industrial and Economic Development Agency. UNIDO promotes fair and transformative global partnerships. We bring together investors and technology providers with industry development projects in developing and transition economies and in emerging markets. Projects for greater energy efficiency and renewable energies, for green hydrogen, for carbon capture and decarbonization, for circular economies, for vocational and technical training, for SMEs and jobs. Jobs. That is what UNIDO's work is. Bring it together and create win-win situations. We are working to become the main UN platform for knowledge and technology transfer. We are working to build new partnerships on a whole new level with investors and with the private sector for the benefit of all involved. My motto for UNIDO is progress by innovation. Under my leadership, UNIDO will be a strong partner on your side. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I hope everybody could see it. I think you have to unmute uh, everybody again. So coming to you, um, um, Marcus, uh, when we look at the United Nations SDGs and we look at uh, Bosch's current announcements going into hydrogen, going into significant sustainability and having, you know, your view on the African continent. Uh, in how far can we still meet the SDGs from your point of view? And what does the industry do to support it? Uh, yeah, thank you, Thomas. I mean, it's a very complex question. And I think I'll only touch on maybe two uh, elements uh, of this complex question because uh, there's uh, many uh, sustainability goals. So I just concentrate on the energy side and I might also concentrate on industrialization as two of them. I think uh, if we're talking about food, if we're talking about education and other goals, uh, that would be a completely different matter. So uh, Bosch has indeed announced uh, in, in the past few days that we are uh, very strongly investing in the hydrogen economy. And just as um, uh, Mr. Müller has just uh, mentioned, um, Africa will play a big role in that in our point of view. Uh, there's sun, there's wind. Uh, there's many um, um, natural resources that we can rely on and that are also needed for electrolyzers, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in that sense, uh, Africa for us as Bosch uh, is a key um, uh, region where we are actually uh, looking at also being in, um, involved in the hydrogen value chain. So um, I also believe, by the way, we are involved with quite, few, uh, quite a few um, African governments that the African governments see it similarly. Uh, in at least in, 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 in ECOWAS, in Southern Africa, in other parts, in, in Northern Africa. So they're uh, very positive that we'll see positive development even short term. Uh, the second element that I just wanted to mention uh, that was the uh, element of industrialization and creation of jobs. It was also mentioned in Mr. Miller's uh, speech. Um, I believe and I, I'm very much involved with the automotive industry and the African Continent Free Trade Area Secretariat that actually since 2020, the speed within which African governments have started now to talk to each other to really create this African continent trade area is just enormous compared to, uh, I wouldn't really say a snail pace, but um, there was the agenda 2063 of the African Union and many programs since uh, uh, 2013. But uh, this train is now uh, before it was maybe a metropolitan train. And now it is becoming um, uh, a high-speed train. And there I'm also very positive that uh, we'll see at least midterm, not really maybe short term, but we see the first um, uh, SKD, CKD, so semi-knockdown and uh, completely knockdown plants in Ghana and Kenya, 
of uh, large automotive manufacturers and uh, automotive industry is only four of the industries that uh, the African continental free trade area secretariat is now focusing on. So on that part, uh, I'm very positive, but uh, we can talk maybe later in, in terms of if we create jobs, uh, decent jobs, what that means also for a decent education in Africa, where maybe we've uh, gone a few steps back uh, in, the, in the last uh, two years. So I'll stop for now. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Batram, uh, from your perspective, um, and you have to unmute, um, we see all these crises. We saw COVID, you know, where, everybody, where you know, the world learned that there was a home office. Uh, we see the supply chain difficulties, the logistic difficulties between Asia uh, and Europe, uh, which leads to an enormous um, inflation also. Uh, and now we see the Ukrainian war. On the other hand, that uh, uh, we need to um, um, uh, the world in particular, also Europe, Uh, has to improve its inflation, to react on it, to find new ways to, for energy resources. What is your observation from an uh, innovation point of view? Would these crises actually enhance the innovation? And uh, you are today in India. Do you see that not only in Europe, but also in India and Africa, there is a push for innovation? Yes, I think if you're looking back to the, to the history, every time where there are wars, where there are troubles, I think there is also the drivers for innovation. And also what I'm seeing now in Africa, but also in, in India, uh, that with this uh, crisis, COVID crisis, also the Ukrainian war, uh, there are coming new ways of uh, corporations, uh, especially what we have discussed here in the last days that uh, German companies actually are looking for new partners here in India, but also in, in Africa. They are very open to these uh, corporations. In the past, uh, we have learned also from our perspective uh, and our educational programs with, uh, with industry, they are always very skeptical about uh, these uh, collaborations, especially with the emerging countries. Uh, but with this way, I would say uh, there will be the starting point again. And uh, um, as uh, mentioned, there is a high uh, speed on this. And on the other hand, Uh, there is a high transmission in technologies. Uh, as uh, Markus mentioned, especially in green energy, uh, there are new solutions are coming up very, very fast. Uh, we are discussing in, uh, in, in Africa about green hydrogen, green methane product, product production. Also here in India, there is a big discussion how we can speed up uh, the green hydrogen supply, how we can speed up uh, green technologies and green energy in order to reduce uh, CO2 and in order to face uh, this climate change. And again, I would say with this uh, actual crisis, uh, it came a new dimension in terms of the speed of transformation has accelerated. And uh, this, I would say, is on the one hand good that we are coming very quick into new solutions. On the other hand, the crisis itself are really challenging, and I really do not know how we are facing, especially now in the future with this uh, Ukraine crisis, especially. Thank you so much, Petra. Um, Coming now to you, Serene, um, um, we discussed now already with um, uh, Markus and Bertram uh, about technology, innovations, trends, industrialization. But we also hear a lot, uh, particularly from the African continent, is this a new wave of colonialism? Yeah? Does uh, Africa um, uh, uh, basically become on a shortfall again in this new transition of decarbonization? There's a lot of um, um, uh, uh, movement from African leaders saying, uh, you know, we only uh, submit 4% of the CO2 Why should we not have, you know, this kind of industrialization which you benefited from in the West? Yeah. 
How is your view from an African perspective and as an African entrepreneur? What, how can the West and Africa actually um, uh, get together to a win-win situation? You have to unmute, please. Thank you, Thomas. Um, quite an important uh, question that is. And uh, uh, Marcus, it's interesting to to hear your your uh, uh, Bosch's uh, commitment to in, on the continent. And um, so, you know, one has to look at. Uh, I'm going to use my my social activist cap uh, in answering that question uh, today, Thomas. And uh, one has to look at the the, the fundamental priorities uh, uh, in terms of promoting the SDGs in Africa. And uh, obviously, uh, food security is is a is a is a very very important part of feeding Africa. And uh, the Ukraine war has indicated how vulnerable we are as a continent um, to uh, the, the, the threat of not having food and the possibility of almost 15 million women and children dying in the next uh, five to six years. Uh, and that is a reality that, that we, we, we're facing right now. So... Um, Africa has enough resources, uh, as Marcus said earlier, in terms of natural elements. We have the sunshine, we have good weather, we have arable land, and uh, you know we need to bring in technologies um, to to improve our food security. The other one is the infrastructure development, and uh, I know uh, you know we talk about colonizing Africa, and we in a catch twenty two situation right now because uh, we don't have the kind of uh, uh, access to, to capital uh, investments to make an infrastructure in, uh, in Africa. We have to depend on foreign direct investments. Uh, we have to depend on the private sector. And uh, we have limited ability to fund these kinds of projects. Um, and the, the challenge is that investors still perceive Africa as uh, not having uh, political stability, uh, not being able to get uh, fast enough returns on their investments. Uh, so for uh, European or Western investors to come into Africa, it is a challenge unless um, also now we're moving into the green energy space. Uh, I think there's a lot of interest there. And I think the way we package these these projects and the, and the, we also need to have the political world. You talk about colonizing Africa. Yes, it is a threat and it is a great worry. Uh, but I think we have also need to have the political will for our leaders to want to improve and use their natural resources to um Eradicate poverty, basically. Uh, one of the other challenges we have is economic uh, integration. You know, the trade between our our countries in Africa is is really dismal, uh, and we cannot produce the volumes to be able to trade uh, because we don't have infrastructure. Things, simple things like rails and telecommunication and energy and uh, uh, that kind of thing are impeding the African growth. Um, industrialization, I mean, that's the way we need to go, especially agro-industrialization. Uh, we need, Africa needs to start using their natural resources and adding value to it. Uh, the other major, major issue in Africa is obviously improving the quality of lives. I mean, there's still a lot of gender bias, gender equality, uh, gender violence, which hugely impacts the economy. So uh, just uh, I hope that um, yes, and we still need foreign direct investment, and we need to manage those. those and I'm very passionate about that. That we cannot be colonized. That we need to work as an uh, in partnership and transparency, and have a lot of governance and accountability going forward. Thank you, uh, Thomas. You are on, on mute. You on mute, Thomas. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. Uh, Marcus, coming back to you. Uh, Bosch is, um, I would say, almost all over the place in Africa. What is your philosophy as Bosch when it comes to uh, what Shireen says, you know, equality, educating people, integrating Bosch into local economies, localization? Uh, can you give us uh, your view on, on this and how to 
creates this win-win situation between Africa and Europe. Yeah, I mean, we in Africa consider ourselves as an African company. So uh, I think if uh, our uh, colleagues in Morocco and our Moroccan subsidiary, for example, would say that uh, they're a European company, they would say, no, we are a Moroccan company. And so we, uh, uh, we are a global company with strong roots, obviously, in Europe, with strong roots elsewhere, but also strong roots uh, in, now in Africa. And so we indeed want to also advance society. And I just want to give two examples. I mean, the one thing is, what we're doing ourselves as Bosch. So we work, for example, now with Lagos state government and train with train the trainer principles, a few hundred uh, artisans to work with Bosch power tools to make them more efficient, to more productive. And that uh, took quite a few months. And at the end of that uh, month, and we did the training, they all got uh, sponsored by the government, um, a tool set that they could then use uh, going forward. So this is something that we're doing in our divisions. And I could, um, uh, this is the power tool division, but we are in, in Africa with quite a few divisions. So we are also doing training and, and uh, other things in, in other divisions. The second element that we are doing is, for example, being involved with NEPAD, being involved with the uh, in, in, in chambers of commerce, whether it is the French chambers of commerce, more in the French speaking countries or the German uh, chambers of commerce, the AHK, where I am, for example, in the Southern African German Chamber of Commerce, uh, the um, uh, chairman of the Training and Education Committee. So we have actually started now uh, five years ago to now provide dual vocational training where actually apprentices work in a company and are employed by a company uh, three days per week and two days per week. There's a standard curriculum like you know it in Europe and that's um, the kind of an export hit as we all know uh, the dual um, vocational uh, training. And, and that is how we also um, indirectly help our business. But um, and for example, we have now also developed um, a curriculum for the tourism industry. Unfortunately, then the pandemic hit was 2019, but we are quite successful with mechatronics, with logistics. Now we're looking at water and sanitation. So there's quite a few and, and now also the hydrogen value chain. So uh, with the companies that are members, so it's not only German companies, European companies, uh, African companies, uh, who are willing to team up uh, under the umbrella of the Chambers of Commerce. We're getting very much involved with training people to be employable and uh, then also later work in uh, globally leading companies or in SMEs in, in Africa. Fantastic. Uh, just one question. When you look at your employees, when you look at your management, how high is the percentage of women? I, I'm not quite sure whether I know the statistics, but for example, our head of tax for Africa is a woman. I mean, she is in Morocco. Uh, I could, um, uh, in, in a lot of our HR people, uh, I think um, they are our head of HR is the only male person. I mean, the, um, the one for, for Africa is a whole um, a women's team. Our country sales um, head for power tools in Kenya is a woman. Uh, so uh, we always want the best people for the job. Uh, it, it is just, in some cultures, and, and we have very many, let's say, engineers, uh, respectively, of salespeople. In some cultures, it is in Africa, uh, I was told uh, it is not so prevalent for women to actually be in these type of roles. So um, a role like text or a role um, in particular uh, more in the in the back office is um, this where we are. But I contradicted myself because our Head of country, uh, the, the country sales organization of power tool sales in, in Kenya is a woman. Uh, so, uh, but uh, it, it, there are challenges uh, all around, but um, I think we're quite diverse. I mean, we are, and we are mostly African. There's a hardly very, very few expats uh, that we have, but we need both the know how, global know how from Bosch, as well as the local know how from Africa. Okay, fantastic. No, that's, that's nice. We're good to hear. Um, Professor uh, Lohmüller Bertram, um, uh, I know that Steinbeis is extremely active on the African continent or in India. Uh, I, I was uh, informed that uh, the Steinbeis University in total has over 1,000 institutes worldwide uh, where they research and educate. Uh, can you tell us more about you know, your research and education activities and to develop social responsibility? 
Yes, these uh, thousand institutes are really active um, all over the world. And uh, in the last uh, years, we have also uh, developed uh, activities on the African continent. Uh, the philosophy of Steinbeis is 100% uh, uh, industry-related uh, education. That means uh, each student is working 100% in a project and is uh, doing the project work in a company or organization. And the main aim is how to transfer the theory then directly in, this, in the theory. And uh, this, I would say, is also important in order to develop uh, the African continent and also uh, to link up uh, the industry with the uh, latest uh, research and also uh, developments in, in innovation. Uh, in Africa, uh, therefore, we have established uh, so-called centers of excellence, uh, but not only in Africa, we have it in uh, India, Central Asia, and South America. Uh, in um, Africa, uh, we have established one with uh, the University of Lumpubashi in the DRC, uh, where we want to establish also research, but also together with uh, project integrated education, uh, with referred to the SGG uh, criteria, the point is how to bring skill development, education, and also innovation into the ground in order to develop the regions uh, furthermore. And this is only possible if you bring uh, the expert and you bring the expertise into the regions and work together with uh, local partners. And I think this is also one important key for the success of Steinbeis. Uh, that in internationally in the regions, it's not a German department. It's always a collaboration between a local partner and Steinbeis University, where we are looking for synergies, where we're exchanging educational programs, where we are linking up our uh, relations to the industry and looking for possibility how this uh, project integrated education could be established uh, in the region. And uh, this is also important, not only with local partners, uh, especially in Congo, this research center, we have there a cooperation with uh, universities from the partner countries, uh, also the Japanese research center for battery research is involved with the former uh, winner of the Nobel Prize, where we also bring uh, high qualitative uh, research into the ground and develop also their research capacities in the continent and in the country. And of course, everybody is bringing in uh, the competences and uh, my philosophy and the philosophy of Steinbeis is, we are working together as partners. Everybody is bringing in his specific experience and together I would say this is the basis for innovation, especially what can be done and how can be the region and regional industry can be developed uh, furthermore. And this is the philosophy not only in Africa, uh, we are doing it as mentioned also in other countries. And one Im other important point is we are linking up these centers of excellence always to specific industries and specific technologies. Uh, in Lumbumbashi, the focus is on battery development because there um, it is planned uh, to develop a big zone for battery manufacturing. In Namibia also, this was a discussion with uh, Marcus, with Bosch and South Africa, we want to establish a center of excellence for green hydrogen, where we're bringing together all experts worldwide. Uh, also, Sherry mentioned this big topic, uh, agriculture. Therefore, uh, we are looking now for a good location where we can set up for a center of excellence for sustainable uh, agriculture, and also, I would say, green agriculture. And the same is in digitization, always with this focus, industry-specific local partner. I would say this is a success factor also uh, for uh, the centers locally, and I would say also the centers here in Africa. We are building up together with our partner network. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, uh, coming back to you, Sorin, and uh, I want to ask you, you know, to... Um, limited to, to five minutes, because then we will open stage to the audience for questions. Um, I, we have seen a lot of amazing technologies actually invented in Africa when it comes to smart farming, vertical farming, 
and so on. Uh, and uh, even uh, um, Professor Lomola told me that, you know, the research results he has uh, first seen now in the center of excellence with the colleagues from Africa. Quite amazing, you know, how much progress the African R&D sector has made. And also when we see the uh, venture capital statistics, you know, that venture capital investments in Africa go literally through the roof uh, because of the innovative power of Africa. On the other hand, we don't see really an internationalization of these technologies. You know, it's mostly in the local markets where they market their products. You hardly see major African innovations in the European market, in the American market, and so on. So what does it take, you know, to make this step further into internationalized African innovations and technology from your point of view? Okay, so first of all, I'd just like to say that it's very encouraging and I'm very impressed to note that Bosch and uh, the, the Steinbeis University is making uh, such uh, great investments in terms of technology, training, skills skills development. And that is a huge gap that Africa has. And uh, and as I said earlier on, you know, we don't have the capital investment uh, and uh, to, to put into you know, technology and, and, and training, and there's a huge digital gap in terms of skills uh, uh, on the continent. Um, uh, in South Africa, I think we, we're a little bit more fortunate in that uh, we've, uh, we've tried to close the gap. However, in terms of where we need to go in, in, in industrialization and moving the continent forward and really being able to be recognized uh, for technology and innovation, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to happen. So it's very encouraging to see the big companies and international companies bringing that kind of uh, technology and knowledge to the continent and not only just bringing it, but funding it. And, and uh, the Steinbeis University's uh, strategy of having um, on the job training, so to speak. Um, so there is this huge gap. And uh, I think the more we start having an inclusive program of uh, uh, and, and partnerships, actually, uh, with uh, international technology companies and African companies, and I think the whole idea is to leave the skills back in Africa and make people, you know, allow Africans to take ownership of projects and ownership of 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 uh, the green technology of of uh, industrialization in agriculture in all aspects of of wanting to improve society that we train and skill and fund uh, these projects for Africa. So yeah, I think we 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 got a long way to go, but I'm glad to say that uh, the ball has started, uh, the wheels have started to turn, and it's, it's very encouraging. But coming back to my question, uh, what does it take to really internationalize African technology? I mean, and, and maybe uh, Bertram and uh, Marcus also the question to you. I mean, we have seen really amazing technology on the continent, you know, whether it's from fintech, whether it's um, uh, smart farming, whether it's, uh, you know, other innovations in, in, in even in the hydrogen field. Um, what can the international community and, and like companies like Bosch or Steinbeis do to promote actually African technologies, which are, from my point of view, there are many of them which are breaking through technologies. Can, can I answer that? You know, there's, 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 uh, we'll take agriculture for, for example. I think we're very advanced in vertical farming. In South Africa, we have the technology, but I don't think we have the capacity in terms of investments to promote that that technology. And I think for international companies to come, it would be good to see them partnering with local technology uh, uh, innovators uh, to promote the technology. If that answers your question, we we need that investment. Right. I mean, Marcus, what's your innovation when it comes to African innovative power? Does Bosch integrate this innovation power into their activities and promote this African uh, technologies worldwide? Um, I mean, we've re it really started in earnest in Africa only in the last five, six years. I mean, uh, since I joined in 2014. And we have actually developed a few innovative, both on a business model side, as well as from a product side, 
uh, we've uh, had quite a few innovations in Africa that we are actually also bringing now uh, to other parts in the world. In the in the first instance, to other developing countries, but for example, some sensor technology that uh, and here the term frugal innovation is maybe uh, the relevant uh, relevant one. Uh, we actually uh, took so much cost out to uh, compare to what um, this a similar product uh, would have cost uh, or would have um, we would have had to sell it at uh, if we had really developed it from a um, European perspective. We did it in Egypt or we, did, um, we started business model innovation in, in Kenya. And that is now actually brought to the rest of the world. Uh, and I also know, for example, there's a startup which was called Swivel. Uh, four years ago started in Egypt, uh, the public transportation Uber like, and it's now uh, also gone around the world. So and, and backed by uh, big, uh, uh, big uh, venture capital investors. And, uh, and also only really in the last three or four years have there been these global startup awards which actually bring uh, the attention to African startups and then bring global investors and, 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 and show them uh, these type of technologies. So I, I'm confident or I'm quite convinced that over the next 10 years, one will see uh, quite a bit of innovation, uh, not only in Africa for Africa, but in Africa also for other parts of the world. Yeah. Professor Lomola, is this also something where Steinberg gets involved supporting young innovators and, and helps them to internationalize the technologies? Yes, I think this is an important point. Uh, you only can also promote uh, this internalization if you have uh, promoters, if you have uh, persons who are uh, bringing these ideas uh, to other countries. And uh, uh, this is what we are doing also to uh, doing these exchange programs uh, between uh, European students, and also African students, also to uh, exchange uh, uh, knowledge and also to develop new ideas further. And uh, as you mentioned, especially Africa, there is also a lot to do in Europe and in Germany to promote it and also to communicate that there are so good innovations. And I would say also with uh, our approach, when we are uh, integrating industry, it's not only integrated national African industry into these educational programs, it's also that we want to uh, skill up and also to work with international corporations. And this is sometimes not only Germany, Africa, DRC. Sometimes it's then together with India, together with the South African company. And uh, there are then so much dynamic insight uh, that new things are uh, developed. Uh, it needs time, but as mentioned at the beginning, the time is now uh, changing very fast and there is the, also the right dynamics now uh, that there is a high speed that also African technologies innovations are accepted and also will be used in, uh, in uh, Europe especially. Very good. Um, I'm, I'm still looking here at our stage, so uh, I can encourage everybody who wants to ask a question to raise his hand and uh, ask it now. We have uh, another six minutes here in our session. Uh, if there are no questions at the moment from the audience, let me ask, you know, what are the final questions now for this audience? You know, as I said, we the environmental goals um, uh, is our key topic. Uh, uh, Markus uh, Bertham and Jereen, um how is your view on the, until 2030? Are we going to be back on track to reach the Paris goals and to fight uh, basically the climate change? I mean, the report uh, of the climate, um, uh, uh, um, uh, the new United Nations climate report is, is almost discouraging. You know, we are already at uh, 1.2 degrees uh, warming now, and uh, they're expecting the 1.5 actually before 2030 now. So, um, uh, what is your view? Through you, uh, maybe we start again with Marcus. Can the world and can we as entrepreneurs still make it? Oh, that's a very tough uh, question. Uh, I can only say, I mean, we as Bosch, we are carbon neutral since uh, for two years now. <laughs> uh, so uh, we've already 
I made that decision uh, to move in that direction uh, six years ago uh, with uh, with the whole group, so on a global scale. And if we can achieve it, uh, then I believe also many other companies can achieve it if they um, put their mind to it. Uh, but I also know that um, if from a uh, purely African perspective, uh, and, and, and you mentioned that, Thomas, at the very beginning, Africa is not contributing so much. And the question is, how much would it contribute in 2030? Uh, but uh, I also know that, for example, all the, um, the coal-fired power plants uh, here in South Africa of ESCOM are more or less uh, the vast majority of all the carbon emissions uh, on the African continent. And uh, with the transformation, the energy transformation that the uh, South African government also now uh, wants to tackle, um, then Africa will can definitely contribute. In particular, if we're talking about hydrogen value chains and many many other things. So, I'm an optimist by nature. So uh, I, I I would need to answer you anyway that we can achieve it. <laughs> That's one about your view. Yes. Are yes. we going to get it Europe? <laughs> Good. Uh, I'm I'm professor. I'm also keen in innovation. Therefore, my philosophy is uh, with technology we can really make a big step in solve this, uh, this problem. And uh, the right things are going on in, in Africa. Also with Bosch, Marcus, together uh, with you, we are developing these new solutions for uh, green energy. Also here, I had the discussion in India. Even here, there are now between 40 and 50 degrees. Climate change is really hard also in Delhi. And there is also a big discussion how to bring on this transformation. But as in Africa, things are moving slower, but there is a high demand and also uh, there are a lot of initiatives to go in this direction. 2030, maybe it's uh, too early, but if we from the European uh, countries are uh, doing the first step, I think we can also promote and also uh, to support the others uh, to be much more quicker. And at the end, the point is, there is always a business model behind. That means if there are attractive business models, if we can also deal with carbon credits, for example, also to bring some revenues uh, to these uh, countries, to the African continent, I think then it's working and then there is a high dynamic in it. And there I'm also, as Marcus, more optimistic. That means we are on the right way. Uh, things are moving very fast. Uh, I think faster as we can imagine. Shereen, so after two very optimistic views, what's your view? Well, I'm also optimistic for Africa, and I'm talking uh, with my African cap, obviously. I am of the firm belief that Africa is poised and ideally situated to take the lead in global energy production. And maybe for the first time, we don't have to be the receivers of... Um, uh, the, the poor brother of, of the world, maybe for the first time we can go with a very strong stance that we can not only produce energy for Africa, but also for our Western brothers and sisters. So Europe, uh, you know, I know you guys are in an energy crisis. I think you're looking to Africa, for, right? So um, I'm very positive and I think uh, it can be done. Uh, and I think Africa, is. this is your time to shine. And we should take advantage of all the possibilities of uh, creating our own energy and the export market. So, so I know some of our leaders in the recent news have said, no, we need Africa still needs to stick to fossil fuels and gas. I said that I think that's a very short-sighted view, and uh, we need to change that narrative and uh, become the energy producer of the world. And we can. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so yes, we made it in time. Um, uh, another 60 seconds. I see no further comments here. First of all, I wanted to thank everybody here on this panel. I know uh, it was a challenge for some of you, particularly Marcus made it in time in Johannesburg. Uh, and uh, also Professor Omola, many thanks for dialing in from India. I know you have a, a very important uh, session with the Federation of Indian Industry. Uh, Shireen, thank you so much for dialing in. Thank you, everybody, and uh, enjoy the conference uh, from now on. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you for having us. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.